I'm walking towards a quiet corner of the Belgian village of Gelleveld, a stone's throw from the N8, an arrow-straight Roman road that resonates through First World War history and beyond by a different name, the Menin Road. A few hundred yards north is Polygon Wood, another place that echoes with the ghosts of the Great War. Six miles to the northwest is the weaving town of Ypres. Thirty miles beyond that, the channel ports of Ostend and Dunkirk. What's brought me here is this. A roadside plaque near the remains of an old windmill. This is what it says. To the eternal memory of the officers and men of the second Worcesters, who on 31st October 1914, fighting gloriously against a determined foe, gave their lives at Gelleveldt that civilization might be saved. That civilization might be saved. We ran into hell itself, but we were kept up by the thought that the freedom of our old country depended upon the work of the British soldiers. When one thinks of the numbers who lie about those woods, dead and dying, it makes one think that this is war. And it is, Jack, my boy. We made the village look like a slaughterhouse. Literally streamed with blood. We fetched them out of the houses and also bayoneted them in the bedrooms where they were hiding. One hundred years ago, in this once more unassuming corner of Flanders fields, the men of the 2nd Battalion Worcestershire Regiment, factory hands, farm workers, husbands, sons, brothers and fathers carved their names in our nation's history and then slowly faded from its memory. This is their story. To find out what brought the Worcesters here, what drove them into a hundred mile retreat under constant attack within days of landing in France, what made them the very last hope of king and country in the face of catastrophic defeat just ten weeks later, in a war it didn't need to fight, we must go back to the dual alliance of 1892. It committed France and Russia to defend each other if Germany opened hostilities against either. Germany couldn't fight a war on two fronts, so its answer was the Schlieffen Plan. Named after the German Chief of Staff, Count Alfred von Schlieffen, its principle was simple. Military intelligence said Russia would need six weeks to mobilise if Germany invaded France. Six weeks, von Schlieffen reasoned, for Germany to conquer the French, then turn east. The challenge was how. His answer was surprise. Ten divisions would face Russia, with 62 pointing west in a line stretching north from Metz to fool the French into thinking the invasion would be in Alsace-Lorraine. Instead, the line would form a door hinged on Switzerland and it would swing through neutral Belgium. The very last German soldier, von Schlieffen insisted, must brush the channel with his sleeve. Above all, keep the right wing strong, he warned on his deathbed in January 1913. Within 18 months, his plan would be put to the test. On June the 28th, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by Serb nationalist Gavrilo Princip in Sarajevo, the capital of Austrian-occupied Bosnia. When the Serbs refused to let Austria oversee the arrest of the plotters, Austria declared war. The next eight days plunged Europe into turmoil. Germany sided with Austria, Russia with Serbia, and both mobilised. On July the 31st, when Germany ignored Britain's plea to observe Belgian neutrality, Belgium and France followed suit. And on August the 3rd, Germany declared war on France. Britain didn't need to stand alongside Belgium, but the same day, sticking to the principle of the 1839 Treaty of London, she pledged to defend her allies' neutrality. Just before 8am on August the 4th, 
Germany invaded Belgium. Von Schlieffen's door had begun to swing. Unless he withdrew by midnight, Britain warned, the countries would be at war. He refused. It was war. The second battalion, the Worcestershire Regiment, was forged in the days of King William, hammered into shape during Marlborough's wars, then honed by Wellington during the Peninsular War. But it was the aftermath of the Boer War that truly shaped the regiment's most glorious chapter. The answer to the Boer War's failings was the Kitchener Test, a long forced march followed by a practice attack. The second Worcesters left India in 1913 with a reputation as one of the best fighting units in the British Army. Back in Aldershot, they continued the hard work in 5th Brigade under the command of General Sir Douglas Haig. Germany and France were increasing their forces and although Britain at large shared no general belief in the idea of war in Europe, Haig did. At 4pm on August the 4th, the order for mobilisation was flashed to every station of the British Army. It was received at Aldershot that evening. The streets of the faithful city were heaving a few days later when the colours of the 2nd and 3rd battalions were brought here to Worcester to be preserved in the cathedral. Day by day the 2nd were brought up to war strength with reservists and kept busy preparing. The British expeditionary forces moved to France began on August the 9th with the 2nd and the 3rd Worcesters receiving their orders on August the 12th. By the evening of the 14th, their hillside camp in Boulogne was being visited by the French Commander-in-Chief, General Joseph Joffre, and Field Marshal Sir John French. Within 11 weeks, many of those men would win a battle described by Sir John as the longest half hour of his life. Close on midnight, the battalion moved east by train to the concentration areas for four days of training, inspections and practice marches in the extreme summer heat. On August the 22nd, they joined 2nd Division en route to Pont-sur-Sambre, where they rested and bathed, the last taste of either luxury for days. At 1am on August the 23rd, the division crossed the Belgian border. By midday, they'd heard the distant thunder of guns for the first time. While the British Expeditionary Force took up a defensive position along the canal that runs east from Conde to Mons, the German armies were advancing rapidly through Belgium towards France. Within two days, often marching against a tide of terrified inhabitants thronging south, the 2nd Battalion had been moved to plug a gap in the retreating front line and come under heavy shell fire. By 8am on the 24th, away on the right at Charleroi, the French 5th Army had been driven back. Amid the line of Worcesters was 25-year-old Lance Corporal William Finch, a slightly built Brummie. He'd been called up as a reservist from his job driving corporation trams on August the 8th, leaving his wife Lillian and four children, 5-year-old Doris, 1-year-old Stanley and twins Olive and Hazel, in their Blythe Street Ladywood home. The two youngest were just four months old. In 1984, at the age of 95, in an interview with Peter Hart that's now a unique and remarkable part of the Imperial War Museum's collection, he recalled that exhausting march. We forced march, we had to go as quick as we could to stop the jerry from coming over. And then before we reached uh, where I was anyway, the, the gas works where we was making for, uh, jerry was peppering like Billy with coal boxes and everything, what we call coal boxes with their heavy guns. And uh, then all of a sudden what I thought was a bunch of sheep coming towards me, it was jerry's and the different colours of their uniform was different to ours. 
And of course, then all of a sudden we had news to get out as quick as we could. We couldn't fire till we had orders from our officer because we only had 25 rounds of ammunition to use. They hadn't got the stuff. Shrieking villagers were fleeing their burning homes as the 2nd Battalion fell back through Framery. The legendary retreat from Mons, a punishing 13-day slog south, much of it only a few miles ahead of the chasing enemy, had begun. The first four days was a grind of dawn departures, furnace-like days, midnight marches, missed meals and snatched sleep under almost constant fire that took them as far as Mont d'Origny. As they marched beyond their physical limits, they passed thousands of refugees and listened to the distant thunder of guns at Lakato, where the 3rd Battalion were part of the remarkable rearguard action that saved the BEF from annihilation. At 4am on the 28th, they were off again. Men dropped like flies in the baking 19 miles from La Ferre to survey, where they halted for a day while the stragglers came in. In 1984, William Finch recalled that punishing retreat. You, you take up a position across fields or whatever, you, you're the length of your company, and as the Germans kept coming towards you, of course, if they got close enough, you'd belt off at them then. That stopped them. Then that gives the company, the remainder of the company, gives them a chance to get on, retire. The retreat resumed at 3am on the 30th. Over the next seven days, the miles, the heat and contact with the leading edge of the enemy's forces took an even greater toll. By the time they rejoined 5th Brigade at Marie on September the 5th, they'd seen the River Aisne for the first time and marched 110 miles in 12 days, the equivalent of Worcester to their barracks at Aldershot. For the young Brummy, at least, there was no disgrace in making such a long and swift retreat so soon after arriving at Mons. I didn't feel ashamed, but... The thing is, this, we, uh, myself, the way I was I thought, well, I hope we don't get cut off altogether and, you know, the war finish as we've come out to finish ourselves. That's all we were thinking. <coughs> I don't think myself that uh, the retirement was worrying us that much other than uh, getting beaten and what the English should be thinking of us in England. While the grim retreat from Mons continued, the French higher command had been organising a counter-attack. On September the 6th, fresh French forces turned on the advancing enemy columns and broke the front of the German battle line. After the long days of retreat, the order to advance came at dawn on a hot autumn day. At 7.15am, the 2nd Battalion left Marie to march three miles east to a defensive line near Champlay. It soon came under long-range artillery fire. But the Germans had reached their limit. About 2.30pm, the shelling stopped and word ran down the line that the enemy were retiring. What soon became clear was this. Believing the Allies were done, General von Kluck had switched his attack to come from the east of Paris. It allowed the French 6th Army to strike his right flank with 150,000 men. The remainder of the Allies turned round and drove the Germans 40 miles back to the Aisne. The Schlieffen plan was finished. By sunrise on September the 7th, the enemy was in full retreat, but about to turn to delay the advance. On the 8th, the 2nd Worcesters were sent to face the machine guns and cross the forest-lined Petit Morin. By nightfall on the 9th, they'd forced the enemy back. On the 10th, they fought until evening, when news came that the Battle of the Marne had been won. The Germans were again in full retreat. There was sterner work to do crossing the Vale on the 12th, under fire, before a ghastly night 
in high wind and driving rain alongside the third Worcesters on outpost duty. The men took any shelter they could find while rolls of artillery fire lit the sky. From Soissons to Reims, on a 30-mile front, the Germans had turned to make a final stand. The Battle of the Aisne. Having ignored von Schlieffen's deathbed plea to keep the German right wing strong and strengthened his forces in Alsace-Lorraine instead before the war began, General Helmut von Moltke was replaced by General Erich von Volkenhayn on September the 14th. The same day, the BEF and the French 6th and 5th armies attacked the German positions beyond the Aisne. After a brief, desperately needed rest, the second Worcesters spent most of the next six days on the sharp Tilleur Spur, under almost constant fire, defending the line against the expected counter-attack. They dug in the start of trench warfare and stood firm, true to their motto, despite the mounting casualties. Among them on September the 15th was Brigade Commander General Haking. He handed command to Lieutenant Colonel Westmacott of the 2nd Worcesters. In his place, command fell to Major Edward Hankey. 46 days on, he would be central to a glorious chapter in British history. A fresh shell storm greeted dawn on the 20th as the German infantry pushed into the wooded western slopes of the spur. At 11am, A and B companies were sent in with two Highland Light Infantry platoons to drive them back. The woods were dense and 30 men fell from enemy fire. Beyond the wood, the Worcestershire companies fixed bayonets and drove the Germans from their trenches. But as they spread out over the open, the enemy opened fire. The losses were heavy. The Battle of the Aisne lasted six more days. After that, neither Joffre nor von Falkenhayn were willing to sacrifice fresh troops in a direct attack when they could find a way round the enemy's flank instead. So during the last days of September, as defensive lines on the Aisne were strengthened, both commanders sent every available division west and north, close locked in an ever-extending battle line stretching from the uplands of Picardy and Artois to the lowlands of Flanders. The fabled race to the sea would end when the Allies hit the coast in Newport in Belgium in the first week of October. As the fighting neared the coast, the Allied commanders decided to move the British Expeditionary Force from the Aisne Valley to guard the vital channel ports. As part of 5th Division, the 2nd Worcesters relieved the 1st Irish Guards in their trenches while arrangements were completed for the French to replace the British Army on the Aisne. Reinforced by another 100 men shortly before midnight on the 13th, the 2nd Battalion handed their trenches over. They reached Vauxerre at dawn on the 14th and lay hidden until evening when the march resumed through Pell to Fismes. There, at 9pm, the battalion entrained. Destination unknown. As the French countryside slowly passed and the Worcesters speculated about where they were heading, Commander-in-Chief Sir John French had made his decision. Instead of sending one corps to help plug a 25-mile gap in the line south of Ypres, they would reinforce the Allies' grip on the ancient weaving town and the vital corridor to the Channel ports. At sunset on October the 16th, the battalion detrained at Haysbrook and marched through the flat countryside of Flanders to Moorbeck, about 25 miles southwest of Ypres. In a bid to break the rapidly stabilising Allied line and reach Calais, General von Falkenhayn launched the first Battle of Ypres against the British on October the 18th, 1914. The Battle of Lakato the BEF's magnificent last stand in which the 3rd Worcesters had fought with courage and distinction on August the 26th was the last of the old-style one-day battles. After that, 
The victor was no longer the army that held the ground. It was the one with the greatest will to throw men into battle in unthinkable numbers because killing the enemy was now a strategic necessity. The British occupied the 16 mile long Ypres salient which bulged into the German line like a sore thumb. At its heart was Ypres defended by one corps. The German attacks were concentrated along the Menin Road which enters here from the east. Barely eight miles from this towering cloth hall is the village of Gellevelt. At dusk on October the 19th, after four days at Haysbrook, 5th Brigade marched 14 miles north to Popering. Early next morning they crossed flat wooded country to occupy the low Pilkham Ridge. The chilling, wet night brought a tide of refugees that spelt the approach of huge enemy forces as the brigade's advance from Ypres towards Menin was met by a counter-thrust from Menin to Ypres. At the same time, German forces were also moving on Ypres from the northeast. The Battle of Langemark was about to start. At dawn on the 21st, 2nd Division advanced, but a long halt while 1st Division came up into line allowed the enemy time to push forward almost to within touching distance. The leading platoons of the 2nd Worcesters had moved a few hundred yards when they were halted by bursts of fire from hedges in front and were forced to dig in. 30 men were dead, many more were wounded. To the left, 1st Division's advance had also been held up at Langemark. Fighting lasted all day. By nightfall, all four companies of the 2nd Worcesters had been drawn into the firing line among the hedgerows a mile northeast of Saint Julien. Two more were dead, four more wounded, one missing. Dawn on the 22nd brought this now familiar dawn chorus. The reinforced enemy launched several attacks, but each time they were beaten back by the legendary mad minute musketry of the British, firing so rapidly, 25 shots per man a minute, that not for the last time the Germans thought they were facing machine guns. As darkness fell, the enemy's infantry swarmed again from their trenches and they met stern resistance. The Oxfords and Highland Light Infantry held their ground and the Worcesters drove the enemy back with head on fire. But the bombardment and the attacks continued and three more men were killed. Another dawn, another storm of shellfire. The troops, worn out by lack of sleep, could only crouch in their battered trenches. 16 men were killed, 22 were wounded and 10 went missing almost certainly buried by the detritus of shellfire. The relief of 5th Brigade started on the night of the 23rd, but the 2nd Worcesters covered the withdrawal of the British guns and didn't leave their trenches till dawn on the 24th, utterly weary and filthy. They plodded to the halt east of Ypres, where the railway crosses the Menin Road, a place soon to be dubbed Hellfire Corner. They were expecting three days of rest. They had 20 minutes. I'm on the edge of Polygon Wood. East of here, 7th Division had been overwhelmed. The enemy were pouring into the wood. The shattered 2nd Battalion troops led the brigade along the Menin Road to Hooge, a couple of miles southeast from here, and then to this sloping western edge of the wood where they lined up with the Highland Light Infantry for the counter-attack. No one knew what awaited them. British and German troops were thought to be in the wood, so the platoons fixed bayonets and spread into line. The dense undergrowth of oak, beech and chestnut soon broke the line, separating the two battalions until Major Hankey ordered his companies back to reform. When he led them back in, the Germans were waiting. The murderous hand-to-hand -hand fighting through the brambles only turned when a clutch of Worcesters charged, cheering. The cries grew louder and louder until the whole line was yelling, plunging bayonets, forcing the Germans back more than half a mile. But as the wood thinned, 
sharp bursts of fire brought the advance to a halt. The companies dug in until night fell, but the day's price was high. Around 200 casualties had ripped a hole in the ranks, including Lance Corporal William Finch, who had suffered gunshot wounds to his left leg. This is how Lance Corporal George Gadd of A Company, one of the 2nd Worcester's many brummies, would later describe it in a letter home published in the Borough's Journal of Saturday, December the 5th, 1914. Before the Huns knew what was the matter, there was one mighty yell from us, and away we went straight at them. Of course, they went too, but hundreds not fast enough for us. There's no time for reflection at times like these, but when one thinks of the numbers who lie about those woods, dead and dying, it makes one think that this is war. And it is, Jack, my boy. War with all its horrors. In the same edition, a 2nd Battalion sergeant from Winchcombe recalled the same attack. Shrapnel, rifle bullets and machine guns ripped the ground up all around us. Just before the last rush, I ordered my comrades to follow me. As I started, I glanced back and found no one was following for the simple reason every man was hit. I had my coat, trousers ripped up by bullets and pieces of shell. At 11am on the 26th, after a day of relentless bombardment and a night of bone-chilling rain, 5th Brigade withdrew through Polygon Wood. The undergrowth was littered with British and German dead. Further north, the French divisions had been attacking Passchendaele, believing the enemy were close to collapse. At 4pm, 5th and 6th Brigades were ordered forward, but by the time 5th arrived in position... Northeast of Polygon Wood, at 5:30 p.m., the attack had failed. The same happened on the 27th. At 1:20 p.m. on the 28th, they didn't turn back. The Connaught Rangers led the attack at 3 p.m. with the Highland Light Infantry in close support, and the Worcesters and Oxfordshire Light Infantry in reserve, under cover, in a clearing like this in the wood. But the attack was abandoned under more devastating shell fire. On the 29th, the bombardment was so severe that the Rangers and the Highland Light Infantry couldn't even leave their trenches. In his 1984 interview with Peter Hart, Lance Corporal William Finch summed up the appalling losses the Worcesters were taking. You come out, go out into action here and you come out with less men and then you get no reserves and you've got to take care of what you've got and muster somewhere else. And of course you've got to form up again, keep forming up and you get less each time you formed up. While all that was happening north of Polygon Wood, the enemy had massed fresh forces south near here, the men in road. For ten days, the British had been pounded by shell fire and suffered heavy losses. The survivors were in terrible shape and desperate for reinforcements, so on the afternoon of October the 29th, 5th Brigade was broken up. The Highland Light Infantry and Connaught Rangers were placed under the orders of 6th Brigade with a chillingly simple instruction. Maintain your position at all costs. The Worcesters and Oxfordshire Light Infantry moved into divisional reserve west of Polygon Wood. But within a day, the Oxfords were sent to reinforce the line further south. That left the second Worcesters alone, listening to the rolling thunder of gunfire until night fell. The German order of the day for Saturday, October the 31st, reflected the Kaiser's utter conviction that he would end it addressing his victorious army from Ypres Cloth Hall. We must and therefore will conquer, settle forever the centuries-long struggle, end the war and strike a decisive blow against our most detested enemy, he told them. The order finished with the promise that their feeble adversaries 
would surrender en masse if they were attacked with vigour. The crash of gunfire woke the battalion early. They watched shrapnel burst in black clouds above the trees that used to stand here, knowing they were the last reserve. Eventually, alarming news filtered through. 13,000 Germans were heading their way from the south, the other side of Gellervelt from where I'm standing. Barely a thousand men, the remnants of five British battalions, were defending the men in road. Before midday, the numbers told. Straddling the road, the second Welsh had only 70 of their thousand men standing. To their left, the first Queens numbered barely 50. To their left again, the second King's Royal Rifle Corps had been overwhelmed. Beside them, the first North Lanx Loyals numbered just 26, while the second Royal Scots Fusiliers had fought to the last. The right flank of the first South Wales Borderers on the north side of the road, opposite Gellervelt Chateau, had also been rolled back, and Gellervelt itself had been lost. But the British command had one final plan to retake the lost position by the second Worcesters. And the reality was this. Fewer than 500 men were the last hope of the British defence, of the Empire. Ten days of battle had left them haggard, caked with the mud of Langemark and torn by the brambles of Polygon Wood. But their weapons were in good order. They had plenty of ammunition. Three months of war had forged self-belief in their power as warriors. Miraculously, though at half strength, that ragged crowd was still a proud, fighting battalion. Soon after midday, Brigadier General Fitzclarence VC sent for an officer of the second. Captain Senhouse Clark went. 20 minutes later, he returned. A Company was to advance to the embankment of the light railway northwest of Gellervelt. They set off at 12.45 p.m. and would spend the next two hours firing rapidly at any German showing his face on the men in road. Fifteen minutes after they went, Major Hankey was given final orders. The rest of the battalion would attack the lost positions around Gellervelt. Hankey knew time was running out. At 1.45 p.m. he sent scouts to cut wire fences across the line of advance. Extra ammunition was issued. Packs were ditched. Bayonets were fixed. Then he gathered his men. The second Worcesters will take Gellervelt. We can and will do it. Good luck to you all. Fix bayonets. Up lads and at them. Let's give them a bit of Worcestershire sauce. At 2 p.m. he led the battalion in file through the southwest corner of Polygon Wood. From here, the open ground to the southeast falls to the Rutelbeek Valley, then rises again to the ridge above Polderhook that hides the chateau. A thousand yards now split by the modern A19 dual carriageway that links Menin and Ypres. To the right, the church tower I can see was just visible amid the smoke of the burning village. The ground was dotted with dead and wounded. Only the Worcesters were advancing, ignoring the warnings of men retreating that it was impossible to go on and murder even to try. The three companies moved 600 yards down into this valley. Beyond a little wood, the battalion deployed. C and D companies in front, B company behind. 357 men, all told. In front was the bare slope of Polderhook Ridge. Along its crest, 
Enemy shells were bursting one after the other. Major Hankey knew the swiftest way to cross that killing field. He stretched his men into line and the two leading companies broke into a steady double across that thousand yards of rank grass and boggy rough stubble. Pistols drawn, bayonets fixed. Within minutes of hitting the crest, shrapnel and high explosive shelves crashed into the advancing line. Men fell at every step. The rest rushed on faster and faster down the slope, across the light railway, through hedges and wire fences and into the grounds of the chateau. Beneath a cloud of British shrapnel, the young German troops fled. C Company chased, shooting, stabbing and came upon something absolutely unexpected the gallant remnant of the first South Wales borderers. Almost surrounded, they delayed the German advance all day. Without their remarkable courage, the Worcesters' charge would have faced even greater odds, perhaps even failed. Major Hankey strode over to their commander and came face to face with an old friend, Colonel Burley Leach. With him was Major A.J. Reddy, brother of Major J.M. Reddy of the Worcestershire Regiment. My God, fancy meeting you here, Hanky exclaimed. Leach replied quietly, thank God you have come. The enemy were hunted across the fields as C and D companies occupied the sunken road running past the grounds. But the village itself was still in German hands. The Saxon 242nd Regiment. Who opened fire? It was clear the sunken road would be perilous until Gellevelt was secured. So A Company began to clear its burning buildings and under shell fire swept through to the crossroads at the east edge of the village. They were merciless, as D Company's Sergeant Major Sidney Brown described vividly in an interview that would be published in the Daily Times of Monday, December the 7th. He'd been in the first line charging the chateau. We made the village look like a slaughterhouse. Literally streamed with blood. We fetched them out of the houses and also bayoneted them in the bedrooms where they were hiding. We were told to clear them out at all costs and we did it. Lots jumped out of the bedroom windows into the street because our men were rushing into the houses with bayonets fixed. But they didn't escape our men for there were others in the street waiting for them. The constant shelling made it impossible to occupy the centre of the village and the stubborn Saxons held small posts in the scattered houses on the southeast outskirts. But their main force had been driven out. The men in road had somehow been saved. Captain Senhouse Clark had been beside Major Hankey at the head of the charge as the Worcesters vaulted the final stile and into the chateau grounds. His mind was already imprinted with the sights and sounds he would turn into the cool, matter of fact testimony that could be read in the battalion war diary to this day. The heartbreaking spectacle of the wounded stragglers imploring them to turn back and save their own lives as they neared the crest. The bewildering absence of the French in support. The esprit de corps that had fueled this ragged line of khaki and sent the Germans fleeing. Now he stood watching the village burn, a vision he would recall vividly eight years later. Some of the houses went aloft at very frequent intervals. Many others were burning merrily. When darkness came, the firework display was worth seeing. It was weird and uncanny. How well I remember standing with the company commander of the Wright Company among the tombstones around the church, watching for the Hun at the crossroads and gazing at the burning houses, wondering as usual, what next? 
Life, after all, was nothing but one damn thing after another. Sniping and shelling continued, but no attack developed. Everyone was dead tired, and even hungry by this time. The chateau behind us was burning. Our wounded had to be got away, though some fell into the hands of the enemy. The Germans continued their bombardment, yet made no further effort that day to retake Gellerveld. As dusk fell, patrols attempted to contact the British lines to the right. At around 6pm, when none were found, and no other British troops came forward to help the battalion, General Fitzclarence decided to withdraw his isolated defensive line from the forward slope of the ridge at Gellerveld. One by one, at ten minute intervals, the shattered remains of the South Wales borderers and the Worcesters left the burning village. In the darkness, unseen, they assembled and then tramped west along the Menin Road to Veldhook. Of the 357 men who'd advanced from Polygon Wood to take on the 1,200 enemy at the chateau in front of me, just 161 were left standing. 35 had fallen and 161 were wounded. According to regimental records, at least five more men would die from their wounds in the days to come. Four long years would pass before the bayonets of the regiment, this time the 4th Battalion, would sweep through these ruined streets again on the 27th of September 1918. The danger wasn't over for the Worcestershires, however, as Captain Senhouse Clark recalled in 1922. Trudging back towards Veldhook, one more awaited them through the darkness. At about 10 o'clock that night, we got orders to withdraw. And we did so, company by company, in the most orderly and unconcerned way imaginable. Back we went to the new line, which by that time had been dug behind us and which was held once more by the remnants of the same old 1st Division. It was an anxious moment approaching their line under cover of darkness from the enemy side. They had a natural distrust for everyone. So often had mistakes happened. Germans disguised in British uniform. It was a near thing to disaster for the battalion that night at the hands of the Black Watch who held that part of the line and were running no risks. Those of us who were leading heard the challenge, the quiet words of command, the opening and closing of rifle bolts. We answered the challenge and one only was allowed to approach, the remainder kneeling or lying down in suspense. The one who went forward was questioned and cross-questioned, for the Black Watch were cautious, and small blame to them. Having satisfied them, the signal was given to lead on. We led on, fully realising that many rifles were trained on us, and that one shot, by accident, might cause the whole line to open fire. But all was well, and I think this speaks well for the discipline of the Highlanders. We filed through their line and felt comparatively safe once more. The success of our counterattack was already well known and the battalion was already famous for it. Many and hearty were the congratulations hurled at us that night. But our labours were not ended, for more trenches had to be dug, then and there, so we dug, and dug for life. Oh no! There was no rest or sleep possible. We just carried on, and those who live will never forget the strain. A mile or so beyond Veldhook at White Chateau, near what would later become known as Hellfire Corner, the British command were gathering their thoughts. 
It had been a confusing day. The details were often short, the information scant, the picture contradictory. What was clear, however, was this. The frontline troops had fought with their backs to the wall, sticking grimly to their trenches as long as they could, often until the last man fell. As Major Hankey's battered survivors withdrew down the Menin Road, General Haig issued orders to build on the 2nd Worcester's victory at Gellervelt and continue to take the attack to the Germans. But Brigadier General Bulfin knew the remnants of the day were clinging on by their eyelids. And he persuaded Brigadier General Goff to cancel the order, convincing him that to advance was madness, that they would lose the ground they'd retaken. And Ypres into the bargain. At Veldhoek, the battalion halted and began digging new trenches. When troops of 1st Brigade relieved them, they drew back, lay down where they halted and gave in to exhaustion. Their sacrifice against the unknown odds had been immeasurable. They'd driven the enemy back in what Commander-in-Chief Sir John French later confessed was the worst half hour of my life. That night he visited the battalion and explained the strategic enormity of what they'd achieved. We can be confident that they already had a firm idea of what he truly meant. In a letter he'd write home in the coming days, this is how Private Edgar Oliver of Old Hill in the Black Country would reflect. We ran into hell itself, but we were kept up by the thought that the freedom of our old country depend upon the work of the British soldiers. I do wish our young men at home would realise the position. If more men are not forthcoming to fulfil the task set for the British, then conscription must come, and that will be a disgrace for our country, whose aim always has been freedom for her people. But it will be laid at the feet of the single young men who are at home shirking their responsibilities by refusing to respond to the call of their country. I am afraid our young men have not realised that any invasion has been. It's no use thinking fighting could be done then. The first shot fired then will result in the massacre of our women and children. Now is the time for our young men to show their mettle. What Private Oliver knew, as well as his Commander-in-Chief, was this. Had the second Worcesters and the heroic South Wales borderers failed, the Germans would have marched up the Menin Road and outflanked the BEF. Ypres would have fallen. Then the Channel ports. The war would have been lost. Invasion next. News of the remarkable charge at Gellervelt and the 2nd Worcester's terrible losses was typically sluggish in reaching the home front. It was the Worcester Daily Times of Friday, November the 13th that first carried Sir John French's salute to the Worcesters. But it was another three weeks, Monday, November the 30th, before his full accolade was reported. Then, for the first time, the detail of the 2nd Battalion's gallantry was revealed to the people. And the glories recorded on the regiment's colours, which still hang proudly from the wall here in Worcester Cathedral's St George Chapel, had been matched by men who'd lived among them. I regard it as the most critical moment in the whole of this great battle. The rally of the 1st Division and the recapture of the village of Gellervelt at such a time was fraught with momentous consequences. If any one unit can be singled out for special praise, it is the Worcesters. Then news snippets like this began to appear. News has been received that Private Charles Tucker of Garrett's Lane, Old Hill, was killed during the gallant charge by the 2nd Worcestershire Regiment on October 31st. It transpires that Tucker was assisting a doctor to bandage a wounded comrade when a shell burst. 44 more words that unavoidably fell short of telling a story 
that was fitting to the sacrifice. Lance Corporal William Finch spent eight weeks in a French hospital with gangrene until he was moved back to England, first to Peterborough and then to Lincolnshire, and finally to hospital on the site of what's now Birmingham's Queen Elizabeth Medical Centre, where 100 years on, battlefield casualties from Afghanistan are treated. He didn't return home to Blythe Street, Ladywood, until he was discharged from the army in May 1915. The scale of the slaughter in Polygon Wood, in which he had been wounded, matched what had followed at Gellervelt seven days later. Veterans of both counter-attacks would share and compare experiences in the reunions that would follow. His wounds might slowly have healed, but what he'd seen and heard on the front line left scars that ran much, much deeper. I didn't want to go back. It's like the Bishop of Birmingham, Bishop Wakefield, when he spoke to me in the hospital. He said, he, uh, I suppose they didn't hear it, he'd go back. I, and I turned around and told him, I hoped I never went back again. I don't know. I had, as much as I wanted. I couldn't see nothing clever in getting ready for that anyway. William Finch died in May 1987. He was 98. On June the 17th, 1922, Gellivelt Park was opened in Barbourne by the Earl of Ypres, Sir John French, a permanent reminder of what those few hundred men had achieved on October the 31st, 1914, and a place where homes were built to house veterans of the Great War, among them men who'd made that murderous 1,000-yard charge at Gellivelt. A Pathé News film reel of the ceremony exists to this day. I'd passed this green oasis on the bus from Bromsgrove to Worcester dozens of times into my twenties before I realised anything approaching the park's true significance to the county and the civilised world far beyond. The 2nd Battalion, the Mercian Regiment, the Worcestershire Regiment's modern face, holds Gellivelt Day commemorations on October the 31st every year and the Worcester branch of the Worcestershire and Sherwood Foresters Regimental Association lays a wreath in Gellivelt Park the same day. Each man walks past these words of Field Marshal Sir Claude Jacob. Let it never be forgotten that the true glory of the fight at Gellivelt lies not in the success achieved, but in the courage which urged our solitary battalion to advance undaunted amid all the evidence of retreat and disaster to meet great odds in a battle apparently lost. Yet how many people know the reason for this little piece of Belgium in the heart of the faithful city? How many of you, listening now, many with a direct bloodline back to the chargers, can tell this story? And why has the world at large lost sight of the part those deeds played in shaping our day-to-day -day 21st century lives. Perhaps that last question is the easiest to answer. The second Worcesters made their charge just 88 days into the war. Another four years, one week and four days of slaughter would follow. Every crossroad in Flanders, it seems, carries the name of a town or village that figures somewhere in the stories of the menfolk who made us who and what we are. Gellervelt, I'd say, simply became buried beneath the weight of the glorious sacrifices that followed. That and the gradual passing of the generation that made them. Private Thomas Billingham, Private Andrew Brace, 
Private Albert Brooks Lance Corporal Ernest Burton Private Cyril Frederick Collett If you still wonder why the achievement of the second Worcesters and those equally remarkable first South Wales borders we should never forget must be restored to our thoughts on the 100th anniversary of the battle, you should come here. I'm at the Menin Gate in Ypres, where last post is played at eight every night in salute to the fallen. Lance Copra Arthur Hullever, Private Charles Frederick Hadley, Private Arthur Clarence Hitch, Private Richard King, Private John Kirk. Among the 55,000 names carved in gratitude and commemoration on its towering pillars, panel 34 here contains the names of 32 of the 40 who gave their lives at Gellervelt, the ones with no known grave. Sergeant George Frederick Poole, Private John Edward Porter, Private William Powell, Private Robert Robbins, Private Harry Simmons. The others, Private, Private James Charles Richard Hall Smith, and Private John Hayes, Private are buried Smith, a few miles from here at Sanctuary Lance Wood Corporal Cemetery. George Henry Stewart, Private Bernard Brees's grave aptly Swift, is at Polygon Wood. Private Joseph Charles Tucker, Lance Corporal William George Curtis Private is remembered at Courtrike Communal Cemetery, where Private Philip Claude Gill lies, while Private Frederick Edwards and Private Albert Perks rest beside one another at Perth Cemetery, and drummer Harry William George is buried at Bois-Guillaume. In the days after they fell, the battalion moved back and forth under almost ceaseless bombardment, exhausted by weeks of battle and devastating losses, until just before dawn on November the 11th when the enemy's artillery opened a horrifying barrage that signalled the start of the Battle of Nonboshan, Nuns Wood. From here outside Ypres Cloth Hall, the sound would have been deafening. Almost 18,000 Germans attacked across a nine-mile front, defended by just 8,000. The second Worcesters manned their trenches and awaited yet another attack, but for them, none came. The night that followed was pitch black, wet and freezing. Eventually, the firing died away. Then, for the first time in three weeks, the guns fell silent. Non Boschen was the Germans' last throw of the dice in 1914, the last great attack of the First Battle of Ypres, the Kaiser's last chance to clear a glorious path to the cloth hall and the victory speech he'd been denied by the Worcesters and South Wales borderers 12 days before. Bitter driving rain marked the start of a miserable winter, the trenches filled with mud and water, then ice, condemning the frost-bitten troops to further foul horrors. 24 days of slaughter had soaked Flanders fields with the blood of a quarter of a million soldiers. The British had lost 58,150 men, 140 of them second Worcesters. German losses were in excess of 130,000. If you're struggling with the maths, that's more than twice the population of the faithful city today. The perimeter of the salient had shrunk to 11 miles, but Ypres, the prize it guarded, hadn't fallen. It never would. The second Worcesters will take Gallivelt. We can and will do it. Good luck to you all. Fix bayonets. Up lads and at em. News has been received that Private Charles Tucker of Garrett's Lane, Old Hill, was killed during the gallant charge by the second Worcestershire Regiment. And I turned around and told him, I hoped I never went back again, I don't know. I had, as much as I wanted. I couldn't see anything clever in getting ready for that anyway. <laughs>